changing the world of work for women everywhere. We are Watermark. We're the only nonprofit women's leadership organization that spans all industries. We connect, develop, and advocate for the advancement of women in the workplace. The Watermark community includes senior executives, entrepreneurs, and emerging executives that support you not only at the top of your field, but also on your way up. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm so honored to be here and very excited. Uh, for a long time, I didn't come to events. I didn't speak at events because I am an extreme introvert and I'm scared out of my mind doing this. But here I am. Thank you. <laughs> and I would, I would just rationalize reasons why I, I didn't do this, that I was I was going to get distracted from my work, and I dove into work. And I, I realized that that was dumb, because while I was surviving, I wasn't thriving. And after a while, I realized I was making choices that were holding me back from growing. I'm sitting at my desk one day, writing emails, business as usual, when boom, out of the blue, I get an invitation to have lunch with Oprah. Now, don't tell Oprah, but I didn't watch her show. Like most CEOs, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a weekday, I was working, like Oprah. Uh, but obviously, you don't need to watch her show to know who she is and what she stands for and her philosophy. So I knew she could reach people, which is why my company advertised in her magazine. So I type, of course, I'll have lunch with you and 39 other advertisers, because even with Oprah, there is no free lunch. And I hit send. And I think, oh my god, what am I going to wear? The most important thing. Um, and I know that might so sound shallow to you, but honestly, who has not felt the connection between looking good and feeling good? I've spent over three decades of my life trying to amplify that feeling and that experience and this connection, and I believe it's true. And as Oprah says, you become what you believe, not what you think and not what you want. So. I was a teenager back on Long Island, Smithtown, and it was a Saturday morning, and I was getting ready for the big kick line. Um, we, we danced at halftime at the football games, and I'm in my bedroom, and my braces are all shiny, and I was able to cover up all 400 zits on my face, <laughs> and I'm in my uniform with the pom-poms on my sneakers, and a baby blue eyeshadow and hot pink blush, and I go like this in the mirror, and I go into the kitchen where my mother's making French toast for her gentleman friend, and he turned to me and he said, don't worry, you'll be pretty someday. <laughs> so once I pulled the knife out of my heart, I said, seriously, dude, you're a freaking jerk. I said that to myself, though. <laughs> Makeup had my back that day, and it gave me confidence, and it helped me believe in myself. So after I graduated from high school, I went off to college to upstate New York, uh, it wasn't a good fit, so I stopped going. And I transferred to the Florida Ponderosa Steakhouse and worked there. <laughs> uh, there was no email back then, so after my weekly phone call with my mother, hi mom, who happens to be here, she wrote me a letter uh, asking in her most loving and supportive voice, is this what you want to do with the rest of your life? <laughs> Mom was a high school teacher, and this was basically my report card. I was failing her, which reminded me I was failing myself. So at her suggestion, I applied to the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City. They had a new cosmetic division, and do what you love. I love makeup. And they rejected me because I didn't have beauty industry experience. Then I moved to New York City, and applied for a job selling cosmetics at a cosmetic counter in Manhattan. And they rejected me because I didn't have beauty experience. Even though I've worn makeup half my life, <laughs> but that didn't count. But it was okay, you, come, what, you become what you believe, and I like to believe I'm an underdog, that the odds are stacked against me, and that makes me work harder. So 
I was desperate, and I went to Bloomingdale's on 59th Street, and I stood outside the buying office door, which is where they take interviews for the, for the counter, and I waited all day, and I went back the next day, and waited all day, and I went every single day that week until the buyer came out and she said, I am giving you a job to get the hell out of here. <laughs> so I got a job, and it was commission only though, so I only got paid when I sold something, and so I didn't have any rent money. Uh, unless I made a sale. So I ate popcorn and I surfed a lot of couches that year. And then I reapplied to FIT and they let me in. Then I reapplied at Macy's and they let me in. And for the next two years, when I wasn't in class, I was working and watching. And what I was seeing was that women would come in, sometimes just to chat and to connect. And my coworkers took that opportunity to disconnect these women from their money, but for the wrong reasons. I understand you're there to sell stuff, but this is what would happen. I know I look 25, but actually I'm 30 to sell an anti-aging cream when they were actually 23. And it made me uncomfortable. And it, this disconnect between the business side and the women these businesses were trying to serve, that continued on early in my career into corporate life. And it was killing me that big decisions were being made by looking at spreadsheets. And aren't these numbers I would say to myself, aren't these numbers like real people who just want to lift themselves up from makeup? Remember, even Oprah wears lip gloss. So for the lunch, I decided to wear a lip gloss called Rockstar. I've always loved music and dancing. In fact, I would bring that into my work, and we would dance at all hands meetings, at sales meetings, and in the office, and I even danced on live TV. So if there was any day that I wanted to feel like a rock star, this was it. So my outfit, I went with navy pinstripe pants. There was no time for a floral blouse. I wanted that strong look, and I was very excited about my shoes. So before I ever even stepped on the plane to Santa Barbara, I felt great. Till the morning of the lunch rolled around, when it suddenly hit me, I'm meeting Oprah today. I knew that I would be a different person after, so I wanted a photo to remember the old me. So I'm standing in line at the Starbucks before heading to the airport, and I said loudly, excuse me, can someone please take my photo uh, to a room full of strangers? <laughs> and I didn't get any volunteers, so I added, um, I'm seeing Oprah. And as a rule, I don't like name dropping, but sometimes following the rules is really just a way of avoiding something scary, like asking a room full of strangers to take my picture. To get what you want, sometimes you have to stretch yourself, stretch the rules, and stretching can hurt. So after I graduated from FIT, I internshiped at the big beauty brands, and that was in New York, and that led to positions in product development where I'm making the formulas and marketing, and I worked at Max Factor, Procter & Gamble, and Neutrogena, which led me to this job in San Francisco running this little bath and body retailer, Bare Essentials. And we had a handful of stores back then. And we had this little makeup, this mineral-based makeup in the back of the stores. And with all the confidence of a young CEO who was pretty good at product developer, I was really good at product, develop product development, I reworked the formula and called it Bare Minerals and named it and had this beautiful new packaging. And nobody bought it. Nobody wanted this makeup. I couldn't even give it away. Liquid foundation is what everyone was using, and this was very innovative. It was healthy, good for you, and sometimes when you're that innovative, people don't understand it. It's too strange. But it was November, and holiday sales are really important. We only made money fourth quarter. All year long, this is when we made it, so I'm stressing out. I'm up in the middle of the night. We may not make it. My husband is here, stay-at-home dad. Um, I'm supporting the family, but I'm also supporting all of our employees. So I ended up watching TV in the middle of the night, and I ended up watching QVC um, because that, there weren't many other options, and I was getting comfortable watch, listening to these women on the TV, talking to me in my pajamas in the middle of the night, taking my mind off of work. And I started buying the stuff on QVC. It was good quality. <laughs> and I bought my set of three stacking gemstone rings, and I still have them. They're fabulous. And then it hits me, maybe I should try and get my product on QVC. I can't afford traditional advertising, so let me try it. But that really doesn't make sense, because you have to match your skin tone to the makeup. But that didn't really occur to me when I decided to go on air. To get what you want, sometimes you have to stretch yourself. So, 
On that Mother's Day, I jumped out of an airplane, tethered to an instructor whose parachute didn't open. My husband and young son, two little dots, growing bigger by the millisecond, my husband having warned me before going up on the plane, are you sure you want to like, die in this field in front of your son on Mother's Day? <laughs> but I figured if I could survive this, I could speak to 90 million households on live TV. I have a fear of heights, and I have a fear of speaking. And the sh backup shoot finally opened, and I went on QVC with a product that I cared so deeply about that I got the viewers to care about it because they could see I was super passionate about this makeup that I believe could change women's lives. And I wanted them to know I had their back, like the industry had my back when I was a kid. Six minutes later, we sold out what a store did in two weeks' time with a wait list. So when I got back to San Francisco, I got a phone call uh, from a woman who lives in Georgia. Her name is Maureen. And she called to find out what color nail polish I was wearing. And she told me that there was some conversation happening on the message boards on QVC. So that night I got home and I went online. And I saw that women were talking about their under eye circles, they were talking about their relationships, their kids, their lives, their work, and a little bit about makeup. And I stayed online for four hours. And I stayed online four hours every night for the next 10 months straight because I was obsessed. And then I started calling customers to thank them, giving them my personal cell phone number, which I had to change four times because they kept calling me because I kept giving out my personal cell phone number. <laughs> and then I started giving away stuff from my house in online giveaways. So I would go in my closet and give them my clothes. I'd give away my shoes. I'd give away my jewelry and family heirlooms. Uh, doesn't everybody do that? Uh, <laughs> till my husband said, where's that vase? And then I had to be more discreet so that he wouldn't notice. <laughs> but I still did it. Uh, eventually, these conversations turned into a full-blown social network till the internet wasn't enough. And we needed to meet in person, so we did bus tours. I actually rented out Lady Gaga's bus when we went all around the country. We stopped in malls and Sephora's and Ulta's and Bear Boutiques and uh, parking lots and Hooters even, don't ask. <laughs> um, we were applying makeup to each other's faces and then we went on girlfriend weekends in New Orleans and Las Vegas and San Francisco for three day weekends together. We went to hotels and had pajama parties. We went on weekend cruises and we would dress up in our gowns at the captain's table for dinner. We would dance at midnight. We asked our customers for product ideas. We named our products after our customers, and we watched these products become collector's items. We were building this company together. And allowing customers to participate in building the business is very powerful. I loved connecting with these women. We got to know each other, and it was amazing. And this passion kept leading me to new connections that gave me more confidence that led me to some more mind-blowing experiences. So, Standing in line at Starbucks, in my pinstripe pants, my power shoes, my rock star lip gloss, name dropping to get somebody to take my pre-enlightenment photo. When the woman behind the counter, now, she's been taking my order for the last eight months. She says, why would Oprah want to have lunch with you? <laughs> Which is a good question, but not helpful in that moment. But the police officer standing in front of me, he could tell this was a big deal <laughs> for both of us. So we take a photo together, and I head to the airport to meet the other attendees, who turns out are also feeling like rock stars, the lucky few going to the royal palace, which we kind of are. So the plane lands, they pick us up in this fancy van, they drive us up this huge hill, the huge gates, there's this huge lawn. I think maybe there's a pond, or maybe it was a lake, I don't know. Someone shouts, there she is, like we've seen a lion in the wild. <laughs> about Oprah, <laughs> standing behind some flowers. We're like pushing each other out of the way to the window. The van stops. They open the door, and we get out. It looked like a house, but I think it was something else, this huge house. There's a woman there with a tray of cocktails. There's Gail King, Oprah's best friend. She's wearing this gorgeous, body-hugging yellow dress. She says, welcome, everyone. I'm so happy and so nauseous got a virgin Moscow mule. I'm literally dressed like a rock star. I feel great and a little nauseous. And 
out of nowhere on the trellis on the lawn right in front of me, Oprah. Her dress, a beautiful shade of buttercream, her hair, casual flowy curls, her makeup natural, understated, chic, like she's at home, because she is, versus me, shaking in my power shoes. Now, as a rule, I try not to get intimidated by celebrities, but to Oprah, me, uh, to Oprah, uh, uh, Oprah's not a celebrity to me. Oprah is an inspiration. So when I think about her, it reminds me to chill out, to go with the flow. Sometimes going with the flow can be re revolutionary too. Because with Bare Minerals, we didn't offer the type of makeup women were actually wearing or using. And we didn't advertise where women were expecting it. We didn't follow the industry rules. and It was a natural evolution. We were breaking new ground. But it was terrifying because being innovative means walking away from stuff that you know. And to keep innovating means you have to keep walking, which is why walking towards Oprah, I'm shaking in my power shoes because if there's anyone who challenges you, challenges you to keep walking, it's her. To look at her is to believe that when you're dialed into your power, anything is possible. So literally, I'm shaking. She puts her hand on mine and I can feel her feeling the blood rushing through my veins. And I can feel the energy flowing through her like she's a vessel using herself to help me. She's for real and I start calming down. Then she says, I love your shoes. <laughs> Are you kidding me? My, my shoes, she loves my shoes, my clunky little man shoes, which makes me love them even more and love her. So deep friendships are the most powerful things that came out of the bus tours, the girlfriend weekends, the cruises. We really got to know each other, and we started really trusting each other. To the point where, through the community, there was a teenager in Oslo, moved to Sacramento to live with a family for her senior year of high school, with the parents never even meeting, because they trusted in the community. So we rolled out more boutiques across the country. We trained the boutique staff to connect in the same way, we called it the girlfriend experience. Share stories, maybe sell some makeup, but at least connect with someone. One of my favorite ways to connect is through handwritten notes. Uh, I've had pen pals since I'm 10 years old, and I love that feeling of waiting by the, the mailbox for these letters to come back. So I tried to bring those ideas from my childhood to work. So when you join the company, you had to write a handwritten note to a customer, something intimate. Not typed, you had to tell them something intimate about you. It's, and that's uncomfortable for new employees to do, but you knew what you were getting into when you joined the company. Which um, often we get letters back, and I had this wall outside my office of customer letters. And I also kept a box by my bed of letters to read at night. Um, some of the most amazing letters I received was from this thing that was called the uh, Sisters of the Traveling Red Gown. So it was the sisterhood of this gown that I wore. Basically, it was a charity event. I wore a gown on QVC, and people would bid, and whoever was the highest bidder, the money would go to a charity. Four women were bidding against each other. A fifth one came in, got it all, got the dress, and she said, I will send the dress to all of you if you can write a story in a letter, take a picture of yourself, and at the end of the year, send the dress and the letters to Leslie. So one woman wrote in a letter, because I got this whole packet, and I have it in my bedroom. She wrote, I'm pretty lucky in love. I've been married to my third husband for 11 years now. You get that? <laughs> lucky in love? <laughs> that is an optimist. It made me smile. So that's why when I pitched our company to investors, I, I said, I don't have an MBA. I feel kind of bad about that. I don't have an M MBA, but I have 10 pounds of makeup in my hotel room upstairs and a few pounds of incredible customer letters by my bedside that I use as my pep talk, reminding me of what really was driving our business. We just wanted to belong to something bigger than ourselves and try and make a difference in the world. So, after I get my picture taken with Oprah, she walks us up this hill to our table outside. In the invitation, she said, wear comfortable shoes, power shoes. But keeping up with her is still not easy. When we get to the top, we see the ocean, which is gorgeous. And we get her assigned seats. You're either on seeing the ocean from side A, 
or side B looking at side A. I'm 13A, two down from 15A, Oprah. Insane. The guy sitting to my right, he's the CMO of Target. He's even happier about the seating and about the wine because Oprah had it all flown in from this special vineyard in France. So we're all celebrating. And after a few glasses, the CMO leans over to me and he whispers, he said, listen, I had this huge picture commissioned painting of Oprah and it's in my living room and I want to tell her but I'm afraid because I'm afraid she's going to think I'm a stalker. <laughs> and I say, go ahead, tell her. She'll be flattered. So he tells her, I overhear him, which is amazing, which leads to something even more amazing. She kisses him, which leads to something insane. I belt out from 13A after two glasses of wine with this little swagger and this little bit of cockiness. Hey, Oprah, what does someone have to do to get a kiss around here? Oh. <laughs> Oprah smiles. She walks over and she says, not only do I get a kiss, but I get another photo. And I feel her hands on my shoulder and her soft lips on my cheek. <laughs> I smell her perfume. <laughs> And snap, got another picture. Then she goes around the table and does this 39 more times. Everyone gets a picture of Oprah kissing them because I nudged the CMO to be true to himself, who inspired me to be true to myself, which inspired Oprah to be Oprah. <laughs> Time and again, I think we all eventually discover this is a powerful way to live. Just be yourself which inspires others to be themselves, which makes everyone stronger. So being ourselves as a company meant getting the word out about our products. And we'd always use infomercials as our form of advertising and word of mouth. We'd bring real people in, and they would tell their personal stories, and we'd film them. At one point in the company, the team is like, you know what, we need to try this traditional advertising thing. So, but you have to understand, that's a huge risk for us. It's very radical when you've been using real customers all that time. So when it came to hiring models out of the portfolio like you normally do, uh, it didn't sit well with me. It was, was wrong. We can't do it that way. So we came up with this idea. We went to LA and we had 80 models come in. And we had this wall between us and all of us on the team were on one side of the wall and the models were on another one by one. They would have conversations with an interviewer. And we signed five women two modeling contracts without ever seeing what they looked like. It was a blind casting. But I just have to enforce here how crazy, crazy that was and how risky that was and how scary that was because no one really knew what we were doing. We did this. So what if my fear was what if all of them are 27 years old and blonde? And we're, this is face. This is not like a gap ad where their heads turn and it's their body. This is a full-on face shot. So you can see we almost pulled out at the last minute because we were starting to get hives. But the, the risk was there, but we decided to move forward. They were beautiful, they were interesting, and they were unique. But this is the thing, the employees can see in that moment we were the real thing. We didn't just talk about serving our community. We risked millions of dollars to, to live our values. Uh, it would have been really easy, trust me, to just hire five beautiful women, pretty faces, and be done. We probably would have had huge commercial, commercial success, but it wasn't about that. It was about we needed to live the values, and it worked on so many levels for us. And it just reinforced this core belief that fear is often the loudest voice in your head, but you can lift yourself and everyone around you above the fear when you listen to that voice. It is scary, yes, of course it's scary, but do what you think is right. That's the kind of thinking that leads to innovative actions, like hiring models based on a conversation or asking Oprah for a kiss. So, what I didn't think through about my rock star outfit was my underwear. I focused on my lip gloss and my uh, shoes and my pinstripe pants, but somehow my underwear slipped under the radar. So when I got up to use the restroom, I asked my waitress, and I swear we all had our own, 
swear to God, there were 40 waitresses there. <laughs> so I felt very close to her. <laughs> I said, excuse me, can you see if I have a panty line? Which is mortifying, because I do work with Sarah Blakely. I'm on the board of Spanx, and she would kill me if she knew. <laughs> but these things happen to all of us. And sometimes, like, the next few minutes, because right after I leave the restroom, I spot Oprah, like, on the other side of the room with three women. She was leading them down to another restroom in the house. And I shout out loud with my outdoor voice, Oprah! And she turns, and the other three women turn to look at me, and I say, Oprah, what brand is your toilet paper? Because it is <laughs> the softest stuff I've ever used. <laughs> and that is true, I said that. And it wasn't one of my finer moments. <laughs> but, you know, Oprah is so tuned into people. She did not let me feel embarrassed by this at all. She, I, that, what a gift that was that day. She's incredible. And being, part of being incredible is to act in the moment and to be in it, even when it feels risky. So a few years ago, um, I was with Every Mother Counts, the organization that was founded by Christy Turlington. And uh, we went to Haiti together. And one of our stops was this girl's orphanage. And we brought a huge suitcase full of toys for the young girls. And we had jump ropes and color chalk and nail polish. And all the kids are playing. And I brought my Canon camera, and I'm taking pictures of everyone. Um, everyone's having a great time. Except I looked up, and there's a balcony area. And there were a bunch of teenagers up there. And they were um, kind of glaring at us. And I tried to make eye contact with the leader of the pack, who was wearing this brown top, but she wanted nothing to do with me, nothing to do with my photos, nothing to do with any of us. And she takes the group down the stairs, across this huge cement courtyard, as far away as she can go, under a tree, on a curb, in the shade. And I know I'm supposed to be part of this whole thing with the young girls, but I keep feeling this energy there, and I feel like I need to connect with them, and I really want to connect with them, but I'm I kind of felt like I was dissed by them. And it reminded me of high school when I wanted to be friends with the popular girls and they didn't want to be friends with me, but there was something that was telling me I had to try. So I went with this urge because I knew I'd regret it. So I um, decided to, to do this, which are these lunges that I learned in exercise class. <laughs> and I'm going across, and I, th and I thought, you know what? The bus is 50 lunges away. I can just climb on the bus and be done. No one would know. And I wouldn't humiliate myself in front of these teenagers. But if I saw some kind of a reaction, I would go over to the girls. And sure enough, they were looking. They looked confused, but they were looking. <laughs> so I lunged my way right back, right to them. And now I'm standing 10 feet in front of them. And they're sitting on the curb. And they speak French, and I don't speak French. So once I got there, I'm like, oh my god, I can't even talk to them. <laughs> now what? And then I start dancing. And I do the robot, which I'm really good at. <laughs> and then I picked that up from Soul Train in the 70s. And then, and then I do the rock, which is a dance I picked up from In Living Color in the 80s. Remember that? <laughs> and then I do Martha Graham, because I did this in college, and then I did some tap. I did even country line dancing and the hustle. I mean, whatever was coming to me, I'm dancing. All of a sudden, some of the girls start getting up and start clapping, and they're giving me a little bit of a beat, and then they start like hollering a little bit. And I'm just now getting into it. It's hot, though. It's like 95 degrees and 100% humidity, and I'm going at it. All of a sudden, the young girls are putting down, they're ditching the um, toys, and they're running over. And my son, who's with me on the trip, he's 21 at the time, he comes over. Now, I am an amazing dancer. You could tell, right? <laughs> my son is unbelievable. So now, we're dancing together, like we're contestants from Dancing with the Stars. <laughs> and we're getting into it. And then, all of a sudden, I don't know what came over me, I started twerking. <laughs> and that's when my son said, enough, Mom. <laughs> so, um, we're done, and we bow. And I uh, showed the girls that Trent was my son. And the girl with the brown top uh, came up to Trent and said, um, you have a cool mom. 
in English, which was uh, one of the proudest moments of my life. Because that young girl inspired me to push myself just as Oprah inspired me. The thing is, I didn't second guess it. I knew there was something that said, you gotta do this, you gotta do this, it's risky, it's scary, she could reject you, rejection is not fun. You have to do this anyway. And oh my God, if I could just tell you, I danced in Haiti with teenagers who wanted nothing to do with me. I'm gonna live with that feeling the rest of my life and I still have goosebumps. But you know what? It forced me to make a choice, to give in to my fear or go back to blending in. Push past through it to try something new and it takes guts to do that. Everyone I know, whatever life stage or set of accomplishments they have, they wonder if the self-doubt's ever gonna go away. It doesn't go away. It's uh, the only choice we have is really how to manage it. I chose to speak up to Oprah and you know, I'm gonna say that it's gonna sound silly, but that kiss gave me huge confidence and it wasn't the kiss, it was that I asked for it. Uh, maybe today you'll choose to introduce yourself to somebody who you don't know and maybe that connection will lead to something mind-blowing in the future. I wish I had done these conferences when I was younger and I, am, I wanna congratulate you guys for all being here today and every time you do this to meet new people because it inspires you to make better choices in your life for the rest of your lives. And I wanted to tell you about this story that I read a few weeks ago in the New York Times, you maybe read it, it's this guy named John Goodenough. He's a scientist and he patented a battery a month ago that will help revolutionize electric cars. The guy is 94 years old. And he said, some of us are turtles. We crawl and we struggle along and we haven't maybe figured it out by the time we're 30. But the turtles, the turtles have to keep on walking. I love this guy because I've been walking my entire life and I bet you guys do too. Even when it's not easy as I learned in Haiti and from Oprah and right up to this moment because I'm an introvert and this means I have to stretch myself. But we can do it, it's a choice. Personal power is a choice. Choose to keep walking, thank you. I want to show you something. I just want to show you, because I, I don't have slides, I just want to quickly show you. Here's the picture of me with the police officer. Here's the picture of me dancing in Haiti. And here's the picture of me with Oprah. It would be nice if I had it on a screen, but I can, yeah. And oh wait, the force of beauty models. The diversity, I know you can't see it, but I brought them because I, I've told the story about this before and people want to see it. Anyway, that's it, thank you.